Hello everyone, my name is Thumper the Rabbit Rabbit. Welcome to Chapter 3 of my 2021 Rust Electricity Guide. In Chapter 3, we're going to be talking about switches. Uh, there are technically five switches with one variant in the game. I say one variant because uh, when we're talking about the regular switch, which is the first thing we're going to talk about, um, there is a variation of this. So this is it. This is the switch. Let's take a look at the switch. Level one item, simple, metal frag, turn it on, turns on, turn it off, it turns off, right? Basic. Um, the smart switch is actually a variation of the switch that is level two, it uses high quality tech trash. You can buy this at the bandit camp. The only difference between these two is the smart switch, you have to be standing in front of it to turn it on and off, or sorry, the regular switch. The smart switch, pairs to the companion app for Rust, which is really cool because then you can use your smartphone to flip this thing on and off, um, you know, wherever you are. And that comes in very handy if you want to be able to activate uh, defenses or lights or whatever you want to do, closed doors, you can do it from your smartphone, wherever you are, you don't have to be standing in front of the switch. So smart switch, very handy. Uh, regular switch, also nice for just turning on and off basic circuits by hand. Uh, both of them have these handles on the side. They both behave the same way, and they both behave in a, re a relatively counterintuitive way, I will say. And what I mean by that is they're actually kind of freaking buggy. So uh, my recommendation is don't use these unless you understand the use case under which you want to use these. Uh, most people assume that these were just gonna be an automation trigger. You apply a unit of power, it switches on. You apply a unit of power here, it switches off. Um, that's a true statement, <laughs> kind of. Um, it's true in so far as if you apply power here, it will turn the switch on. If you apply power here, it will turn the switch off. But there is some unusual behavior that occurs here. You'll see I'm sending 20 units of power in, but watch what happens if I were to use automation to turn this on. It turns on, turns green. Um, it's sending in 60 and this handle actually preempts the input of the switch. So it's no longer a simple switch. It's a, I don't know what's going on here. Like it's just, you know, it's taking this input instead of this input in the on condition. If I now disconnect that, it's off. So if I had sent momentary power here, it would turn the switch on and then it would go dead. So it's not really good for automation. It's more useful as like an input selection. If I want to put more power in here, I guess that works. If I only want it to come on when I'm putting in power through like this guy, this has only got five. You'll see now it takes the five instead of the 20. This handle always preempts. Not, it doesn't take the higher of the two. It just takes whatever you've got connected here. And if you disconnect it, the switch is dead. I mean, dead, dead. Like even manually, it doesn't work anymore until you disconnect its input and hook it up again. Now it works. You have the same problem if you use the off handle. If I put power on the off handle, it will turn off, but then once I disconnect it, the switch goes dead, even if I manually turn it on and off. This same thing happens with the smart switch, so use extreme caution about how you're using these handles. There are specific scenarios where this could come in handy, but be certain of how you're using this, because otherwise you're just gonna have a bad day. Um, don't at me with, hey, it doesn't work when I turn it on. It doesn't take my power input. Like, I know that I just told you it doesn't fucking work right. So um, use it as a dumb switch. Uh, use the smart switch with your smartphone. Um, don't use these handles unless you know what you're trying to accomplish because they have a very limited application. They're not simply, you know, click it on, click it off type of automation tools. All right. Well, great. Now I've blown five minutes of this uh, walkthrough on just the smart and dumb switch of the simple switch uh, variations. So let's get on to other things that are more interesting and actually more valuable. Uh, the next switch that we'll talk about is the and switch. Let's see, where's our and switch? There it is. Level two item. It's only metal frags though, so still cheap to get. Um, again, logic gate uh, activates if both are in both inputs are powered and it takes the greater of the power source. So this is handy for a couple things. First of all, it must have A, nope, not working, and B, boom, there we go. Take one off, turns off. So this is a great conditional switch to use whenever you want things to turn on only if two things are true. 
So it has to have A and it has to have B. Both and it's true. And it takes the larger of the two inputs. That makes this a really valuable component in big circuits because you can use the AND switch as a power booster. Um, I'll show you a demonstration of that right here. I put up one with an HVHF because that's where you'll have a really uh, important uh, reason for using this for power boosting. Uh, but just know that the AND switch means A and B must be on for this to be true, for there to be output, and it takes the larger of the two, okay? Now the OR switch, by contrast, only needs one side, A or B, not both, A or B. So if I put A on here, it works. If I put B on here, it works. If I put both on here, it works. And it does take the higher of the two in this condition. So if you had a scenario where you've got two different power sources and you want the circuit to work, if either of those circuits are on, so maybe you've got a whole power generation plant coming in one side and another whole power generation plant coming in the other side with batteries and whatever, and you want it to run your turrets, if either of those gets blown up, it still works because you've got redundant power coming in on both of these. That would be a scenario to use an OR switch, okay? But it works if either of these are on and it will use the larger of the two. Um, by that I mean if you set, had like a large battery here and a small battery here, so 100 here and 10 here, it's going to use the larger of the two. But if you disconnected the large battery, it's still going to use the small one because as long as one's true, you're good to go. So uh, hopefully you're still following me. And as both inputs have to be on or switch, it'll use either of them. In both cases, they use the largest input available. Okay. Now uh, here's a demonstration of power boosting. Um, say you've got this turret here, like this. There's actually a turret right here. No shit, you don't even have to imagine it. Uh, but a turret needs 25 rust watts to operate. Let's say you wanted this to be activated by this HVHF sensor. Now, we'll cover HVHF sensors in a future chapter, but the way an HVHF sensor works is no matter how much power you're putting into it, it outputs the number of rust watts equal to the number of people that it sees. So right now, it sees me. It sees one. So if I, I don't know why I have an OR switch here, but what the hell. Um, so if I turn on A or B here, it's gonna make this uh, circuit turn on, the light turns on, it powers up the HVHF. And because it sees me, one person, it's gonna output one rust watt. Well, one rust watt is not enough to turn on a turret. You know, 20 is not enough. If it saw three people here, it still wouldn't be enough. But the reason it's on right now is because on this side, I put in 100 rust watts through a test generator. This is where the AND switch works fantastically for power boosting circuits. The one rust watt of me standing here and making this true activates A. And of course the AND switch takes the bigger of the two sources, which is B. So if I'm not standing here, if I back away far enough, you'll see as soon as I get out of range, the light will turn off, the HVHF will turn off, and the turret will turn off because the AND is no longer true. There's 100 coming in one side and zero coming in the other, turret is off. Or I guess SAM site, right? Um, however, if I walk up close, and I add the other unit of power here and make this true. Now there's 100 units of power going through so I can power a few of these SAM turrets, all right? Uh, same's true for anything else you've got, whether it's you know auto turrets, SAM turrets, doors, lights, whatever. Um, you standing here providing one unit of power is not gonna be enough to power anything useful, but it is enough to make this a true statement and you could be putting in 500 units of power here and powering lights. SAM sites, turrets, everything, right? So as soon as it sees you, hundreds of power goes through here and turns on everything you want. So that's why the AND switch is incredibly valuable for logical circuits uh, when you wanna work off of triggers like an HBHF or a laser sensor or a pressure pad or anything else that just puts out a small amount of power that you wouldn't necessarily pass through to everything. Now those devices, you can pass through more power, but the HBHF, you can't. It does depend on how many people it sees. So you're almost certain to use an AND switch after an HBHF if you're doing any type of logical processing of uh, devices. Okay, so we covered the AND, we covered the OR. 
Um, let's talk about the XOR companion to this. So the XOR, here it is. Uh, this is an exclusive OR logic gate. That's what the XOR is, exclusive or uh, basically a not. Um, if both receive power, no output, okay? So unlike the AND switch that needs A and B, or the OR switch that can use either, the XOR switch you, works if and only if one is true. So if A is true, it turns on. There we go. If B is true, it turns on. If A and B are true, it turns off. That's the exclusive OR. You can't have both on at the same time, okay? Now, I put a blocker next to this here because uh, a lot of folks like to call out that the blocker and the XOR are the same. That's not entirely true. And I actually set up an example over here. Um, it's kind of dumb, but it'll make the point. Um, the blocker does in fact stop power if both of these are turned on. It blocks power if only this one is turned on. And that's the difference. With the XOR switch, if either of these are true, it passes through that power. In the case of the blocker though, uh, which we'll cover in a later chapter here, it passes its input power if and only if this block pass-through handle is not true. See, now we're blocking. Now we're not blocking. Now we are blocking. But it's not either of these that can turn on the circuit. I should hook up the light to prove that. See, if this were an XOR, it'd be on right now because we're putting power in one side, but that's not true. If I put it here, light comes on. If I put it here, no light. If I put through both, no light. So not quite the same as the XOR. So for everybody out there who loves to razz me about these being the same, they're not the same. Now, there is a practical reason for using one of these versus the other, and I've set that up here. So this is just a really dumb concept. <laughs> um, it's kind of fun, but it's dumb. Uh, what I have is an HBHF that opens my door for me when I want to leave. Like when I get close to the door, it sees me. It's set to authorized only. So if it sees a friendly uh, approaching the door to leave, it's open. If I walk away, it closes the door. So kind of handy, opens the door automatically for me when I want to leave. Now, let's say there's somebody door camping outside. I don't want this to automatically open anytime I get close to it. So I put an HBHF outside that's set to trigger off of other people, unauthorized people. Now, I'm gonna spawn another entity player here. Hopefully this will work, there we go. So now it sees an unfriendly. Now that unfriendly is putting in power to this side and my friendly HBHF on the inside is putting power to this side. Sounds great, right? If it sees me, it tries to power on the door, but if someone, if there's an unfriendly outside, they would trigger the other side and prevent the output from opening the door. Sounds great, right? Well, here is where the XOR is not the same as the blocker. If I walk away, guess what happens? It goes from both being true to one being true, and now suddenly an enemy can open the door. <laughs> That's terrible. That's not what I wanted to happen. I want it to only open for me, and only if there isn't somebody outside. So that's where the blocker actually is different, because I can be specific. I can say my friendly HBHF is the power source going to the door. And there we go. When it sees me, power goes through and opens the door. Now I take the HBHF from the outside for the unfriendly trigger and I attach that to the block pass-through handle. That now negates my friendly trigger anytime someone is outside. But it doesn't power the door, so therefore, when I walk away from this, the unfriendly person outside does not cause the door to open anymore. So, I don't know if I just made that like way more confusing than it needs to be, but um, there's my practical demonstration of why a blocker is different than an XOR switch, okay? XOR, either condition true makes it open, both makes it false. 
whereas the blocker, a specific condition makes it true and a specific condition negates that true by blocking the pass through, okay? Now, I realize it's not really on topic here. Oh, you know what? I had this person standing out here. Here, watch this. So it's not opening the door because I got a door camper. Now it's open. <laughs> Um, don't do this. I mean, people can very easily blow out your HBHF and then this wouldn't work anymore. Now, if you're smart, you'd notice that this wire disappeared if they blew up your HBHF. But, um, yeah, not... I I'm absolutely not recommending this build right here. Um, yeah, for, for so many reasons I don't even want to get into. Maybe if you're on a PvE server and you want something that's like... Just doesn't open the door when there's like a scientist or some shit out there or a zombie. Maybe this is helpful, but... If you're playing on a regular server, somebody's going to ruin your day with this setup right here. <laughs> Hopefully it explains the logic, though. Okay. Now, um, part of the reason I wanted to introduce the concept of the blocker here, even though I'm not getting to those components late until later, um, there is one more switch. It's called the RAND switch. They actually call it the RAND switch. RAND switch for random. All right. It's level two, but it's still only metal frag. Now... The purpose of the random switch is every time you hit the set handle, it's going to roll true or false. And you have a random chance of this thing turning on or not. Now, uh, you can see right now it looks like it's off, um, but that's counterintuitive. It, okay. So if you watch any of my old videos, any of my old builds, what you're going to see is the RAND switch being used to randomly activate circuits. That's what it used to do. This switch used to be off by default. It used to turn on anytime you randomly rolled the true condition. Unfortunately, that also caused a bug that allowed people to get unlimited power. They didn't fix this. They just flipped it. It's like a blocker now um, because it was originally designed off a blocker. Here's what happens. This isn't a random on switch. It's a random blocker switch. I know that sounds dumb, but that's just how this functions now. So when you put power onto this, it passes through unless you randomly turn this on and block. So right now it's off. I can true that if I reset, you can see green and red means it's off. It is not blocking power. Now if I randomly roll true, which I did, now it is on, two greens. Now we are blocking power. Now it is randomly off, not blocking power. Randomly off, not blocking power. Random off, random true or on. Random true means block. Random true block, random false, allow power. Now, if you happen to look at any of my old videos before January, you're gonna see me using this RAND switch for triggering circuits in the like the shooting gallery and other circuits where I randomly wanted things to turn on. All those old videos don't work anymore because they flipped the functionality of the RAND switch. So, shit on me. Um, you can still use it for the same purpose. You just have to use it like a blocker now and randomly block as opposed to randomly activating. Um, it's still fine. It's a random circuit. Um, it's great for if you're gonna build puzzles or traps that you want to have a random element to them. Um, random shooting gallery, random doors opening, random, you know, uh, turrets turning on. Uh, you can really screw with people with this. Um, there are some practical sort of quality of life things you can do with it that are not directly tied to puzzles or traps. Um, one of them, uh, I honestly cannot remember if I published this video. Um, I did actually do a test build once of a base that had HBF Jeff sensors all around it. And if it saw someone come nearby, it would randomly light up furnaces or turn on lights or, or put out furnaces, um, to try and trick the person to think that I was home. So they wouldn't offline raid me when I wasn't actually home. Um, it it was helpful because when because it's random people will walk up to your base and hear nothing and then they walk up to it again or they walk around to the other side and then so, suddenly something happens they can't just keep walking around the base and hear stuff open and close because of the hbhf 
They hear things randomly happen, which makes them more likely to believe that you're home. You might not talk back to them when they start cursing at you, but at least, you know, maybe it tricks them. That was the only practical sort of use of the random switch beyond doing puzzles and traps, okay? All right, well, we covered a lot here. Um, we're already shoot 20 minutes in, which is a lot just for covering the basic switches, but hopefully uh, you got the, the basics of all of them. Uh, we'll just recap real quick here. The switch, basic on off, uh, has the smart switch variant, which you can actually go buy at the outpost. Uh, this pairs to the companion uh, smartphone app. Uh, we've got the and switch, so A and B. We'll turn this on, and it uses the higher of the two inputs. We have the OR, A or B. We'll turn this on. Again, it'll use the higher of the two if they're both connected. Otherwise, it just uses the one that's connected. Uh, common use of the AND switch is for boosting power from a conditional, like an HBHF can make this true and pass through a bunch more power. You've got the XOR switch, where it'll turn on if A is turned on or B is turned on, but not if they are both turned on. Uh, and we'll get to the blocker again in a future video, but same kind of functionality, but specific conditionals as opposed to either of them being a conditional. All right. And then finally, the last thing with the name of switch is actually the RAND switch, which is actually like a blocker that you can randomly activate and randomly deactivate. You're just rolling the dice here. You got a 50-50 chance of whether or not this is going to block power. Okay. There you go. That's about all I can tell you. Five switches. Technically six if you're counting the variation of the smart switch. Great for uh, logical uh, components, logical circuit building, and for boosting power, which you're probably going to need. So, good luck, and don't suck. <laughs>